Somebody asked me a really strange question the other day. I was um, at a shop getting a cup of coffee. And often, you know, when a holiday is coming and people are making small talk in a store, a cafe, right, they ask you things like, oh, what are you doing to celebrate Thanksgiving, Christmas, Canada Day, whatever. This person said to me, what does Canada Day mean to you? Kind of surprised me. You know, it went a little step beyond traditional small talk. And I mumbled some answer. I, I don't even remember what I said. But I kept thinking about it afterwards. What does Canada Day mean to me? Now, I was born in this country, but I've lived more than half of my life in another country. And now I'm back here. So all sorts of strange mixed emotions. And I was very aware of the fact that often in my life, I would define being Canadian by what I wasn't. And I think many of us do that. It might be because as Canadians, we're really, really polite. And we don't want to put ourselves forward and say, yeah, well, I'm a Canadian because I do this and this. Maybe there's something else. Sometimes we define ourselves by going, well, I'm Canadian because I'm not American, I'm not French, I'm not Japanese, I'm not a Muslim, I'm not from such and such a place, I don't do such and such. You know, we tend to com define ourselves by what we're not. Sometimes I think that, that we do that when we don't feel that great about ourselves, right? If I don't feel like I'm very good, as long as I can find a handful of people who I think are worse than me, it makes me look really good, right? Terrible logic. I think we all do it, but it's bad logic. And in the face of that, we have this wonderful gospel reading this morning, which is a perfect text for Canada Day. It's a perfect text to remind us of how important it is to think about ourselves as who we are, but, but beyond that, to think of others as being important. We live in a world right now where, where people are really eager to put others down, sometimes in huge and vast ways. People will go to great lengths to justify, and these are just things from the news, separating families or letting people drown in the Mediterranean because as one politician said the other day, if they drown, we don't have to pay them welfare. That's a fact. It's a pretty bad fact, but it's a fact. We hear things like that, and, and it, it becomes easy to think, well, we're Canadian, we'd never say that, we'd never do that, but we would. There are times when we do things like that. And I think in, in those moments, God calls us to, to go a step beyond finding someone who's worse than us just to make us look remotely good, and instead to put our energy into just being good. What a novel idea. What a great idea. So we have this scripture passage this morning that is often seen as a healing story, and it's seen that way because it's got some healing in it, but the healing in this story is completely incidental. This is a story about something else. It's a very intentionally written, very intentionally constructed story to teach us a very powerful lesson. And I think, frankly, we often turn to it as a healing story because then we don't have to focus on the real meaning because the real meaning can, maybe even should, make us a little uncomfortable. Someone comes up to Jesus and says, my daughter is dying. Will you come and heal her? And immediately that sets up the story. Now, it may not set it up for us because we tend to like our children most of the time at least, right? We're allowed to have a few exceptions when they really misbehave. But generally, we love our children. We care for our children. Certainly, if our children were sick, we would do whatever we could to care for them and help them recover. Not so in biblical times. Children, sad to say, but, but we know it's true, children were quite disposable. And girls even more so than boys. Which is a bit ironic because girls were a source of income. 
We have to take ourselves back to the way the culture lived in those days, rightly or wrongly. You could sell your daughters to other men as brides and make money off them. You couldn't sell your sons, but you could sell your daughters, and you did. And yet still they were even more disposable than boys. Children were there so that they could look after us in our old age. That was really it. So someone comes to Jesus and they have gone way outside the box because in essence they're saying, my disposable thing at home is dying and I want you to heal her. Which is a way of saying she's not a disposable thing. She is my daughter. She's a person. I love her. And I want you to make sure that she lives. Anyone witnessing this story, anyone hearing this story at the time that it's happening or when it's being told by Mark and other gospel writers would immediately know, wow, this is very strange. This fellow Jairus, he's a really important guy. He's one of the main synagogue leaders and he cares about his daughter. He cares about her that much that he wants her to be well. Amazing. So that's part one of the story. Jesus goes to Jairus' home. Jesus goes to spend time taking care of a disposable being. That's another amazing part of the story. All right? Jesus could so easily have said, sorry, not going to do it. It's just a kid for crying out loud. She's only 12. I have far more important things to do. If Jesus had said that, no one around him would have really been that surprised or really that bothered. But that's not what he does. Someone has a need, I'm going. I'm going to go and take care of that need. So then the next part of the story, while Jesus is on his way to go there, someone approaches him from the back. So he can't see them. It's a woman. Now, it's not a coincidence either that this woman has been plagued for the very length of time that this girl has been alive. Isn't that interesting? This girl's been alive for 12 years and now she's dying. This woman is much older than that, but she has been a nobody for 12 years. She's been hemorrhaging. She's been bleeding. This has made her ritually impure, ritually unclean. You do not talk to this woman. If you see her on the street, you walk down the other side of the street. You spit at her. You can kick her. That would be okay. You can certainly call her names. She is a nobody. An absolute, absolute nobody. She's also a very wealthy nobody, which is an interesting little footnote in the story. Even her wealth can't get her the one thing she needs. She has spent all of her money on doctor after doctor after doctor, which is the clue as to how we know that she's wealthy. She has spent all of her money on doctors. None of them can heal her. For whatever reason, she thinks Jesus can do something. But she's very careful and very clever and very compassionate. To touch Jesus or even to speak to him would have rendered him ritually unclean. So she wouldn't do that. A part of me thinks, hey, you're already a nobody. You have nothing to lose. It would be okay to go up to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, could you help me? Because the worst thing he's going to do is hit you or kick you, and well, everybody else does that anyway. But she doesn't. She has compassion for Jesus in this story. This is a great little story. She has enough compassion for Jesus that she's not going to talk to him. She's not going to touch him, and she's not even really going to touch his clothing. See, to touch a person's clothing would even render them unclean with one exception. They knew that when you were walking, and everybody wore long robes, right, that would get dirty. So they thought, well, gosh, too much risk of our clothes getting dirty, and that could render us unclean. So the Pharisees had decided that the distance from your thumb to the end of your index finger, that much of the bottom of your clothing was not really your clothing. It was the hem wasn't really the hem, but that's where we get the word hem from. This was the, non-clo- this was the non-clothing part of your outfit. Kind of weird, but that's how detailed they were. So if someone touched that, it would not render you ritually unclean. So she has enough compassion for Jesus 
that she thinks, I could at least touch that. He'd still be okay, but maybe, just maybe, I'll get something. So she sneaks up behind him. She touches him, just that part, that little bottom part of his robe, inconsequential, and immediately she's healed. Immediately she is made whole. Immediately a 12-year hemorrhage stops. Can you imagine how good she feels? If this story ended at this point, what we've got is no consequence for anyone else and this person having had a 12-year plague end. Awesome. Amazing. But the story doesn't end there. While she is feeling, I can't believe it, I've finally gotten the thing I've been looking for, Jesus says, hang on, somebody touched me. And the disciples' response is wonderful. In Mark's gospel, the disciples never are portrayed in a good light, ever. Ever, ever, ever. Right up to the crucifixion, the male disciples never get it. It's, it's, it's almost humorous, actually, in Mark's gospel, because we know that, of course, they do later on because they formed the early church, etc., etc., so that we know that things turn out well for them. But during Jesus' life, the disciples try really hard, and they always seem to fail at figuring out who Jesus is. They're never presented in a good light, so the tone of voice here probably is the disciples going, oh, for crying out loud, Jesus. Here you go again. You're doing your nice Mr. Compassion bit. You think somebody's touched you. Of course somebody's touched you. There are dozens of people all around you. We have something important to do, Jesus. We're supposed to be going to Jairus' house. He's an important person. And you're standing here going, somebody touched me. No, come on, let's go. We're running late, as it is. Let's go. They're very impatient, and they have no idea what has happened. But Jesus does. So imagine you're this woman, and you're feeling wonderful. Your life is just finally been made really good, and Jesus turns around and says, excuse me, who touched me? And you're caught. She's got to suddenly go from feeling really way up here to way down here again, because Jesus has caught her. And she fesses up, and she goes up to him in fear and trembling, and says, it was me, I touched you. And Jesus says, that's good. That's good, you touched me. You've been made well. Because you dared to step forward and get what you needed. This is an amazing thing for Jesus to talk to her is astonishing enough. Men didn't talk to women other than their wives in public. And you only talked to your wife if you had to. You did not chat about the sports scores or even make dinner plans. You chatted to her if it was vital, if it was an emergency. Otherwise, you did not talk to women. Men did not do that. You talked to all the other men you wanted. You didn't talk to women. So Jesus talks to her. He talks to her to tell her she's done something good. He talks to her to give her a name. Did you notice in this story, both of these women, the girl and the woman, are nameless. And Jesus gives her a name. He calls her daughter. If a woman was married, if a woman had a father, if a woman had a brother, or if a woman had a son, if she was attached to a man, she existed. If she had none of those, she did not exist. And we can pretty readily assume that this woman, giving, given her obvious age, if she's had this plague for 12 years in adulthood, etc., that she probably is not attached to a man. So she is a nobody. And Jesus, by calling her daughter, says to the community, she is somebody. Jesus restores her to absolute, total, incredible fullness of life. That's part two of the story, and that's pretty amazing. And then we get one more bit in the story. People come from Jairus' house, and they say, don't waste Jesus' time anymore. The little girl's died. She was disposable anyway. Now she's dead, so forget it. The whole atmosphere around that would have been, it doesn't matter. There would not have been a whole lot of grief amongst the people who were not immediate family. It just was the way things were. Jesus ignores them. Jesus ignores the people who come to him and say she doesn't matter. He ignores them because she does matter to him. So he goes to the house. They say, good heavens, she's dead. He says, she's not dead, she's only sleeping. Just as an aside, I always find it interesting. Biblical literalists always tell me that Jesus doesn't mean it here. 
And I go, but if you take it literally, he has to mean it. She can't be dead. It's a weird, one of those weird oxymoron juxtaposition backwards things. But in any event, it doesn't matter, so let's not get hung up on that piece. It doesn't matter if she has died or if she is just sleeping or in a coma or very, very sick or whatever, because it's not a healing story. Jesus goes in to see her, even though everybody else is telling him he's wasting his time. He goes in to see her, and he takes Peter, James, and John with him. If you've ever read the Gospels much, you know that whenever something really big is happening, who goes with Jesus? Peter, James, and John. It's kind of the, because this is pre-computer days, right, when they wrote the Gospels. So it's sort of the way of saying, this is in italics, bold print, and underlined. Pay attention. Peter, James, and John are all there. This is big. And what happens in this big thing is Jesus goes in and talks to the little girl, and she gets up. <laughs> he talks to her. He treats her like a person, not as a thing. And then there's a funny part of the story, and we never get the funny part because, again, we're looking at it as a healing story, and we think it's a story about Jesus. We have to treat it with great reverence. We can never laugh. Something really hilarious happens. Jesus brings the living girl out of her bedroom and says, could somebody get her a sandwich? It's really quite humorous. I'm glad some of you laughed. This is a really funny part of the story. This is Jesus knowing that everyone will expect him to come out saying, I have done a great miracle. And he doesn't. He comes out and says, get her a sandwich. Get her something to eat. <laughs> Life is going on for her. See, in these stories, the people's reaction is these are nobodies and they don't matter, so why are we wasting time? And Jesus interrupts that nonsense and in essence by his actions says they matter because they matter to God. They should matter to you. And if they don't, stop what you're doing. And think about it and make sure they do matter. This is an incredible story. An incredible story that too often we lose because we get caught up in details about how people are healed. And that doesn't matter. What matters here is to get this lesson from Jesus that if someone needs something, we as followers of Jesus are called, are expected to see what we can do. To say to the person, you matter to me because you matter to God. In this world where too many people are finding too many ways to say that lots of other folks just don't matter, they're just not as important as us, we can't care about them, we can only care about a finite number, and they're just way too many, we should throw these people away. We should disregard these. We should ignore these. In the face of all of that, we read this story. And Jesus says to us, don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. If someone has a need, they matter to God. Let them matter to you. Happy Canada Day.